My name is Marius from MP Cybersecurity. Hello and welcome guys to the second episode of Introduction to Cloud Security. Today we will cover everything about identity and access management. So in the first episode we cover most of the basics of cloud security. We covered the shared responsibility model, the cloud um, deployment models. We also covered the benefits of the cloud and common mis misconfiguration. So this episode is all about identity and access management. So let's get straight into it. So as we can see from the images below, identity and access management service components are made up of four main components. It's authentication services, authorization services, user management services and directory services. So any of you who are aware of IAAA uh, identity pillars, it's all about identity, the authentication, authorization and audit. So these make up the core pillar of cloud security, identity and access management. So identity and access management is one of the key components and one of the probably one of the hardest ones to implement in our cloud security journey. So if you think like whenever you manage users who require access to multiple types of data in order to do their jobs or purchase a product, you need a strong set of standards to help you implement access controls and protect your information systems from cybersecurity threats. This is commonly known as identity and access management. So not only does IAM grant secure access to what you and your applications do. It also grants access to the many service to service calls that occur behind the scenes. So as an example, I am in action, something like Amazon Web Services I am service handles more than 400 million API calls per second worldwide. Nonetheless, even if your organization only handles a single call per second or minute or even an hour, IAM has never been more important than the present day. So what is IAM? So identity and access management is a growing field focused on ensuring that data shared across your organization is accessible to the right people and remains inaccessible to those who should not have access to it. So Gardner essentially sums it up by saying that a good IAM program enables the right individuals to access the right resources at the right times for the right reasons. So IAM enables you to manage IAM users and their access. You can create users in your identity management system, assign users individual security credentials, such as access keys, password, multi-factor authentication devices, or request temporary security credentials to provide users access to services and resources. You can specify permissions to control which operations a user can perform. You can also manage access for federated users. You can request security credentials with configurable expirations for users who you manage in your corporate directory, allowing you to provide your employees and applications secure access to resources without creating a user account for them. You can specify the permissions for these security credentials to control operations a user can perform. So most IAM solutions centralize the key pillars shown in the image on the left. So as you can see, identity, which essentially is a factor that can be used to recognize a person or a device in your enterprise. Authentication is essentially a procedure of uniquely distinguishing a person or a device. Authorization is the process of giving someone permission to do or to have something. And directory is where the user is stored and, and, and we can connect to the other stores for federation. When considering user profiles in the identity and access management solutions, there are several ways of defining the user risk and resource requirements. So let's break it down to a few of these. So role-based access control versus attribute access control. So role-based access control is essentially an access control mechanism that provides access rights depending on the user's role in the organization. It's the most common type of access control and the simplest one to deploy. Whereas attribute-based access control grants access rights to the user by using a combination of attributes together. ABAC is the most flexible, but also the most complex. ABAC enables refined access control that allows for more input variables 
into an access control decision and requires input from various business units in your organization to successfully implement. As an example, ABAC would be allowing only users who are the type of employees and department HR to access the HR payroll system and only during the business hours within the same time zone as the company. Then we have cloud access management. So cloud computing is rapidly growing architecture that challenges enterprise administrators with varying workloads, data lakes, and user requirements that can create vulnerabilities to various kinds of network attacks and privacy issues. With, this, with its cost effectiveness and flexibility, cloud networks in the public sphere can create more challenges, whereas the public cloud providers creates a walled garden for the infrastructure and the enterprise administrator provides the security to the data property within. In this, this is necessary to have identity and access management. So cloud IAM tools uh, allow administrators to authorize who can access specific resources at specific times by a specific way by giving the software as a service based applications for even more granular control. With any cloud IAM tool, you will want it to provide a unified view into security policy access for your entire organization and have built in auditing that can ease compliance processes. Most of the input impactful benefits of using IAM system for the enterprise are things like single uh, access to all of the enterprise resources. So something like single sign on enhanced centralized privilege management. So the right person in the right area and enhanced centralized security, a single data source for human resources, centralized auditing and logging easy to manage privileges for the enterprise employees it's also easy to integrate with other enterprise software and mobile applications you can avoid accounts overlapping for enterprise systems you can audit track monitor and report user activities and it's also better for compliance so for more <clears throat> specialized approach users can take advantage of third-party products which provide IAM for the cloud-based applications. Some enterprises have built their own IAM by taking advantage of various open source technologies. Though this approach can be more complex and even with targeted solutions, there is still the challenge with identifying every aspect of your organization which need access control while also maintaining compliance and interoperability with legacy systems. This is why IAM like any other form of security, is a journey and is constantly evolving. As stewards of this task within the organization, we must continuously be ever vigilant and evolving as all aspects evolve with time. So enterprises around the world must ensure that all of the employees, customers and business partners all have proper access to information and technology, resources in a secure, fast and efficient manner. By implementing identity and access management tools and following the related best practices, a company can gain a competitive edge by enabling better collaboration, enhanced productivity, increased efficiency and reduced operating costs. So why cloud you know, identity and access management is so hard to implement? Because normally, obviously, organizations normally start with specific roles. And normally the, the problems we have is that pre-built roles in the cloud, they might be too permissive for our least privileged principle. And the problem we have is that if you look at cloud like AWS, Azure or GCP, each particular cloud has anywhere between 1,500 to 2,000 individual permissions. So if you assign someone a role that has a couple hundred of permissions, that might be too permissive. And creating for each user or for each specific type of role or specific type of group in your company, creating custom roles is a, very, is a very cumbersome task. And especially these roles should evolve and change as business operations changes. So that's why, as you can see on the right hand side, we have a breakdown of reported IAM challenges that organizations have reported. So obviously, data protection is at the top because if you miss appropriate permissions to the wrong users, then it's hard to protect data. 
Second part is obviously integrating to the legacy system. So as organizations transforming their legacy systems into the cloud, it creates a burden and a task of how we can manage identity and access management as well as well as you know especially when you go into hybrid setup you know how we do federation between um, cloud services and legacy systems that becomes very cumbersome you know moving to the cloud is up there users engaging in technology without approval gdpr compliance breaching the environment and obviously devops practices form some of the top challenges so as we move through the slides, we'll cover some of the main topics. We'll discover all of the service components within IAM. And we'll discuss how we can best leverage the IAM to reduce the risk in your enterprise. So the first component of identity and access management services are the directory services. So directory services are the databases that store some of the most essential information you need to do your job. They are often referred to as data stores, LDAP, and directories. So LDAP is Lightweight Directory Access uh, Protocol, which is essentially mostly used by Windows Active Directory. So the information stored in these vessels include your usernames, passwords, authentication preferences and enrollments, user preferences, application data, and more recently, information on devices such as mobile and Internet of Things, or IOT as we all know. As you can see, much of this information is identity related. But as you can see, normally, as you can see, directory services in the image, it's expand and it's growing with time. We have normally nowadays information about people, about organizations, so organization structure, organization, you know, roles, reporting models, as well as about data, about devices. And then the second part of the directory services is the schema. So such as LDAP, graph, um, uh, relational. So all of the schema essentially says how these this information is going to be stored in your services. So what happens when you fire up an application, whether it's you know cloud, mobile, or traditional application, and whether you are using it for the work or otherwise, the application is going to reach out to the, one of the definitive uh, source of identity truth in your organization, the directory. So this is to validate that you are still a legitimate user of the organization and that you are authorized to access the application and to find out what you can do uh, with it. Essentially, it's, it's, this, it's that simple. But these days, directory services are essentially they are under siege. Many organizations deployed their directory services many years ago in the pre-cloud years. So they are running what we call a legacy directories. While they still work in the traditional sense, there are reasons, both technical and non-technical, to believe we're headed for a directory slowdown. The first reason is that the amount of information being put into the directory services is multiplying exponentially. Consider the things in the sort of Internet of Things. It's estimated that over the next few years, the numbers of deployed um, Internet of Things will reach 31 billion. That's at least four times the number of people on the planet. And all of this IoT data is being registered in directories. The second reason is that directories are slowing down. It has to do with the ubiquitous uh, nature of our work and home environments. Where do you work? You know, if you're like me, your work is anywhere you are. And certainly no further away than your mobile phone or laptop in your hyper-connected world. So the reality means that directory services need to be distributed and highly available so that you can access apps and services you need quickly. A slow link or an overwhelmed legacy directory sifting through millions of entries means you'll, you'll have to wait to be authenticated and connected. And wait is costly. Waiting time, so essentially... The result will be lost customers, decreased productivity for your workforce, users, unhappy application owners, and a situation that will get you worse if not addressed quickly. So directory services are essentially the, the old iron of the business. You need to go away with the mainframe and green screen applications, and they need to modernize. So directory services are made up as of four components, as you can see. Identity store, directory federation, 
metadata synchronization and nowadays we have the virtual directories so just to paint a picture a bit about um, direct uh, the federation services so essentially what is federation so federation is a collection of domains that have established trust so if you think like what happens if our company decides to acquire another company or start uh, forming a partnership that we work together if we have two identity stores especially when you're talking you know when we're expanding company sizes but, but, you know further than 100,000 even 10,000 potentially employees creating an or 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 moving all of the users let's say 10,000 users into your uh, directory services can be a very cumbersome task so therefore we have federation services where we essentially can establish trust between our directory services and we can create roles and permissions for users to be used within that federated network so the level of trust may vary but typically includes authentication and almost always includes authorization so a typical federation might include a number of organizations that have established trust for shared access to a set of resources and also what you can do nowadays you so most of the organizations that started their journey into the cloud if they have a legacy uh, a directory services such as active directory normally they will federate the, the legacy on-premise active directory with a cloud identity store something like aws iam or um, microsoft entra id and essentially use this federation for authentication and authorization so the sign-in method ensures that all user authentication occurs on premises and this method allows administrators to implement more rigorous levels of access control so this is a great way to remove the burden on our administrators now if we move into the next part it's the next pillar will be I am authentication service so authentication service allows us to create a few key controls how we can limit the risk in our organization so we can create a password security based on specific policies such as we can create lockout thresholds so lockout thresholds is essentially is the limit of the number of uh, logins that we allow our users or unsuccessful logins before the account is locked out so it's a great way to reduce the potential risk of uh, dictionary attacks password guessing attacks and various kind of attacks on our passwords that um, threat actors might use so what we can set for example so say we set uh, lockout threshold as five so after five unsuccessful logins the user will be locked out and then we can set we can set specific uh, lockout duration periods you can also um, set you know how the user is going to be uh, allowed back to log in whether we need specific you know um, challenge to be done so user can back log in also another very important part of how we protect our passwords we can create in our identity and access management services we can create a custom uh, banned password lists to enable and it can also enable password protection on our windows devices but just a few points on custom uh, banned password lists so what we can do is because users are essentially creatures of habit and they create specific passwords and they normally evolve those passwords by just changing the number so say say we are working for microsoft organization chances are that some of the users in microsoft organization will like to create a password such as microsoft say zero one and if we create a password rotation policy that passwords need to change every 90 days these people normally what they will do after 90 days they'll change a password to Microsoft 2 and then Microsoft 3 and so on and so on so we can create a custom banned password list that prevents usage of specific words in a password such as our company um, there's a great way what I normally do so we can create a list from websites such as you know pawned and find the top 100 
of commonly exploited or commonly used passwords that very easy to break so we can import that list of 100 uh, passwords and ban users from using that password list you can also enable multi-factor authentication and select which methods are allowed for your users to use so we can select whether we allow our users to use uh, authentication app security hardware tokens you know password uh, mfa through uh, things like windows hello there is a new uh, breed of uh, phishing resisting mfa so most of you guys probably heard by now but setting up mfa through sms message yes it improves security but most of the threat actors nowadays can bypass sms mfa so we can create specific policies or specific requirements of who needs to use phishing resisting mfa so this way we can reduce the potential risk you can also set up things such as you know number of nf mfa denials that leads to lockout accounts so as you guys know for example if we set up mfa on our user whether it's you know you need to type in a code or sometimes we just have a push notification where we need to say yes or no so we can set up as eventually essentially to let us know when a specific user is sent a number of mfa challenges and they say no so if they're not trying to log in and they're getting mfa deni mfa challenges that means that someone is trying to log into their account so again we can create a lockout for that specific we also we can select how many minutes until the lockout is reset and the duration until the um, account is automatically unblocked uh, you know to serve these uh, authentication method methods to reduce the potential of risk there's also the new breed of um, services within authentication service that can can model a potential risk so if we look at uh, you know risky users and risky signings so normally nowadays machine learning and ai is 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 creeping into all of our tools but they can be great for establishing a baseline so they can take things like common ip addresses that user comes from what device are they using which location are they coming from and essentially form a risk so when the user one day logs in from device that he's never used before or from location that had, that they have never been in before they can form a risk so it, it, it can uh, alert you when there's a specific risky user or specific risky sign-ins during real time and we can create policies how we can potentially limit that risk and we'll cover that in in the next few slides so the key way how we'll reduce the risk in our you know authorization flows is conditional access policies so we can we can create conditional access policies that require multi-factor authentication for our administrative accounts which is a great way to you know to limit the potential impact and potential risk for a high privileged accounts we can also create create conditional access policies that limit legacy authentication because legacy authentication nowadays has too many flaws that can be exploited so we can limit that and we can create specific conditional access policies where you know if the specific services you know that need legacy authentication they can be excluded from the policy but all of the users will be included in the policy we can also block access from unknown and unsupported devices so most of organizations nowadays they have a mobile device management platform where all of our devices are managed so we can create policy saying that if somebody's trying to use a device that's not been onboarded in our mobile device management platform they can't sign in into our uh, enterprise applications we can also create specific you know support devices so for example if we are using um, windows as an operating system in our in our environment we can create a policy where anyone that comes from linux or any other operating system they're not allowed to sign in into our enterprise applications we can also create a block access lists from non whitelisted locations so what we can do for example say our business has presence in united states and united kingdom so if we only have employees in those two locations we will create an um, a whitelist location 
uh, list essentially that includes United States and United Kingdom and essentially we only allow logins from those two locations and then everything is blocked by default so this is a great way to reduce the potential risk you know someone trying to log in from china or any other high risk countries where we see a lot of threat actor action and as i mentioned in the previous slide there is the two uh risk categories so high risk users and risky signage so we can create also conditional access policies that allows so, for example, if the user builds a, a high risk rating over the time, we can ask the user to change their password just because we suspect that potentially threat actors are trying to, you know, hack their password. So we can create a, a flow where as soon as the high risk user is detected, ask them to change their password. And then the secondly, live during uh, sign in. If there is a risky sign in detected, so you can generate based on levels. So whether it's, you know, if we allow low is OK and then medium and high, we require them to complete an MFA challenge and only then they can sign in into our enterprise application. So this way we can greatly reduce the potential risk of, you know, accounts being exploited, you know, data breaches and, and essentially threat actors logging in into our enterprise applications. Another pillar of IAM is authorization services. So it's all concerned about the roles, the permissions, the hierarchy scope, groups, customer roles, as well as actions and not actions. So it's all based on hierarchical structure as well, scope and essentially authorization services says what a user can do to a specific resource or specific data. So as you can see on the left, it's, it's essentially a, a picture from um, Azure Cloud. So you can assign specific roles based on specific scope. But one thing that you need to always understand that normally wherever you scope it, it has a hierarchical uh, pass on the roles essentially. So if you if you apply a role at, at managing group, that means that person who has that role will have access to resources in each of the subscriptions that are under the management group, each of the resource groups and resources. So you need to have a strategic decision of how we're going to scope the roles. And that's where the task becomes cumbersome because you can't just arbitrarily decide what roles and how roles are going to be provisioned. And you also need to think how you're going to build your infrastructure so you can scope roles effectively. So as, as in within this, role-based access control is the one of the most important attributes and most of the important factors of how we provision roles and how we assign permissions based on scope so let's dig a bit deeper into what is role-based access control so essentially it's a security approach that authorizes and restricts system uh, access to users based on their roles within the organization so this allows users to access the data and applications needed to fulfill their job requirements and minimizes the risk of unauthorized employees accessing sensitive information or performing unauthorized tasks. In addition to restricting access, RBAC can refine the way a user interacts with data, permitting whether it's read-only, read or write access to certain roles, thus limiting a user's ability to execute commands or delete information so an effective uh, system of user access control is essential for large enterprises or companies that manage a large number of contractors vendors and even customers so for these organizations RBAC will protect critical data improve operational efficiency and help certify regulatory compliance and we'll cover this later in in, in this slide but let's first take a take a look at you know where did this all began so the history of role based access control you know people have used roles and responsibilities to moderate access to commercial computer systems since the late 70s however you know these procedures were ad hoc and often had to be redesigned on a per case basis for each new system it wasn't until 1992 <clears throat> the research from the nist began to formalize the system we know as role-based access control. So in that year, 
They laid the foundation model we use today in a paper outlining a general purpose access control methodology appropriate for civilian and commercial use. So essentially, um, they continue to refine ARBEC from 1990s to early 2000s, building on earlier work to explore the economic benefits of ARBEC to outline a unified model and most notably define separation of duty forms. So in 2004, NIST officially adopted role-based access control as an industry standard. So role-based access um, control model essentially has uh, three types. They have a core, hierarchical and constraint. So the core RBAC essentially outlines elements of every role-based access control system. While the core RBAC can stand alone as an access control method, it also lays the foundation for both hierarchical and constrained models. So as such, role-based access control must adhere to the, to the following essentially three rules. So it has to have a role assignment. So essentially a subject can exercise a permission only if the subject has selected or been assigned a role. Role authorization, so a subject's active role must be authorized. Also permission authorization. So a subject can only exercise a permission which is authorized for the subject's active role. <clears throat> now, in contrast, hierarchical RBAC so by assuming your defenses have already been infiltrated, you can take a stronger security posture against potential threats while minimizing the impact if a breach does occur. So essentially what you can do is you can limit the blast radius to the extent and reach of potential damage incur incurred by a breach. By segmenting access and reducing your attack surfaces, verifying end-to-end -end encryption and monitoring your network <clears throat> in real time. And then the constraint RBAC is essentially a third standard that adds separation of duties to the core model. So separation of duty relations fall under two headings, static and dynamic. So under static separation of duty relations, a single user cannot hold mutually exclusive roles as defined by the organization. So this ensures, for example, that the one individual cannot both make and approve the purchase. So this way we can limit the risk. And in, in dynamic uh, separation of duty model, a user can be a member of conflicting roles. So however, the user may not function in both roles during a single session. So this constraint helps uh, control internal security threats by, for example, you know, enforcing a two person rule in which two distinct users are required to authorize an action. So that's that's the way we can uh, limit <clears throat> some of the common benefits of role based access control. So it increases security. So RBAC restricts user access to the minimum levels required to perform a job. This helps organization to enforce security best practice, such as principle of least privilege, which diminishes the risk of data breaches and data leakage should a breach occur. RBAC also limits the impact by shrinking the attack surface. Access to protected information will be limited to the role that the hacker used as an entry point. So for example, an HR employee who falls victim to a phishing attack can also expose privileged information from the finance department because obviously they, they shouldn't have a role assigned to the finance department. Malicious attacks on any single account are stifled before they can uh, create harm to any other systems. RBAC principle of separation of duties improves security even more by precluding any employee from having sole power to handle a task. With separation of duties, even bad actors within the organization are limited in the damage they can cause. It can also simplify workloads. So, RBAC grants users the exact access needed for their roles, which helps eliminate the bottlenecks. Employees no longer have to badger admins for access to data and systems. And IT itself is freed from the mountain of busy work required to manage one-off permissions for each user. RBAC simplifies onboarding, 
offboarding, and other provisioning, deprovisioning activities. Admins can easily update permissions for existing employees who change roles within the organization or for contractors and third-party users who need temporary access to your networks. All of this increases essentially operational efficiency and offer economic benefits and improve employee satisfaction. So essentially, it's a win-win. Role-based access control also improves your compliance posture. All organizations from healthcare providers and IT vendors to financial institutions must adhere to federal, state and local regulations for privacy and confidentiality. Additionally, compliance certifications such as you know, SOC 2 can improve brand, re brand reputation and offer a competitive advantage for businesses that regularly handle third party data. Demonstrating compliance reflects a commitment to ensuring the security of customer data as well as the ability to protect sensitive information in general. Also, the the authorization, you know, services. It, it's as as we said, you know, role-based access control is. It's one of the simplest to use, but it's not as easy to implement as well. So, you know, how we can implement and leverage the best practices. So to, to set yourself for success by following these role-based access control best practices, you know, don't expect IT to implement our back alone. You have to begin with a conversation across all of the organization departments and then proceed systematically to ease the transition and avoid the necessary friction in your workforce as new systems roll out. Role-based access control implementation requires high level of understanding of business structure and business goals. By collaborating from the start, you will better be prepared to reap the benefits of RBAC and get the most out of your efforts. So first of all, you have to develop an RBAC strategy. So start by evaluating where you are what systems, data, or processes in your organization would benefit from access control? Be sure to include any job functions, technologies, and business operations. You know, start by painting with broad, uh, you know, broad strokes in the beginning. You will refine the process as you go along. Next, you have to consider where you want to be. You know, will you use RBAC to automate provisioning? Do you need a better way to control access to applications that store sensitive data? You know, what is your desired outcome for this process? And finally, note any gaps you need to tackle. Are your authentication authorization models consistent across your organization? Are there any compliance or regulatory requirements you need to meet? Was there a security event that prompted you to switch to RBAC? Once you have mapped out your strategy, you are ready to move to the details. So you have to improve your, you have to essentially first start by inventoring your systems. So make a list of every resource or a service that requires access control. This list may include, you know, email, cloud apps, customer databases, shared folders or a file server and so on and so on. You also have to analyze your workforce. So role and access discovery is both art and science. So collaboration across IT, HR and executive leaders will make the process easier. Start by grouping your workforce into roles based on shared access needs. Be sure to include both current and planned departments. At the same time, avoid the trap of defining too many roles. Well, how many is too many? That will depend on your organization. You know, The right number will restrict access enough to secure your systems without stifling creativity. Large organizations may require a more systematic method of role creation in order to avoid common pitfalls such as role explosion, role overlap, or over-reliance on exceptions. So the two ways you can do that is to <clears throat> evaluate roles from the top down. So business managers should design a set of roles that align with company goals and take the entire workforce into consideration. Rather than focusing on systems and technology, the top-down approach should address the functional access needs for each role. And then secondly, concurrent with phase one, IT can begin a bottom-up analysis, gathering information about the way users are accessing systems, and then generate role based on this analysis. 
you have to create and define roles. <clears throat> so finally, you have to reconcile those lists and map the results of your workforce analysis to the resources from your inventory according to the principle of least privilege. This mapping will define your roles. So for example, you may create a basic user role which has access to the email and Slack and applies to all users in the organization. You may create a, a, you know, a specialist role, such as hiring manager, which has read-write access to the employee database, or you may create an employee database administrator role, which has full control of the employee database, and so on and so on for each department. You also have to establish a, a governance structure. So in addition to defining roles, you need to establish a decision-making body and maintain them. So you have to articulate in writing the project priorities and standards that serve the best interests of your organization as a whole. You know, your access control policies may include performance measures, risk management strategies, uh, role re-evaluation guidelines, direction regarding who maintains the roles, and then a plan to keep the policy up to date. So a policy-based access control helps prevent role proliferation and keeps your RBEC project on track even as your company grows or conflicts between the departments, you know, arise. And then assign people to the roles. All of that preparation has laid the groundwork for the final step, essentially, which is implementation. Now that you have inventoried your systems and outlined the way your workforce uses them, this is the time to assign roles to your employees and begin using RBAC to manage access rights and permissions. Large organizations may choose to roll out RBAC in stages. You know, start with a small group of users, organized around the business function or department, collect feedback and make any adjustments before moving to the next stage. This will minimize the workforce disruption and help you build on small successes and demonstrate the value of role-based access control model. So, congratulations, you rolled out role-based access control. The next task is to keep it running smoothly and making sure that it's on track with your governance model. In previous slides, we touched on principle of least privilege. So principle of least privilege is just as it sounds. It's the principle of having users across an organization being given the lowest level of access that they need in order to perform their required tasks in our cloud environment. So why is it important? So implementing the least privileged is essentially it's a cybersecurity best practice and an important step in keeping your organization crown jewels protected. It's practice to ensure that all privileges are continuously, you know, right sized, balancing your organization's security needs alongside your operational requirements. Applying least privilege extend beyond your human identities to service accounts, servers, and other machines that have privileges that can impact your assets. So the benefits of least privilege is reduced potential of cyber attacks. According to Verizon Data Breach Investigations report for 2022, 50% of attacks exploiting existing privileged credentials. So right-sizing privileges for identities and assets massively reduces the potential for attack. It can also increase productivity, so provisioning privilege based uh, on factors such as, you know, usage analysis allows users to remain productive while also keeping support tickets to an absolute minimum. It's easy, quick compliance, so minimizing uh, access privileges is an uh, integral part of compliance standards since, is, since it reduces your threat surface. So how do we go about implementing, you know, principle of least privilege. So the baseline practices you need to implement in your organization to achieve less privileges, you have to lock down privileged access. This process starts by, you know, identifying which accounts justifiably require privileged access to the assets and permissions. You should start by detecting all accounts with privileged access like admins, both official and shadow admins, by understanding which access privileges are being used for sensitive assets you can also identify <clears throat> if the access is appropriate with the account's role in the organization and if the access is being used regularly. If either of these conditions are not met in a justifiable manner for the business, then you should revoke these permissions. 
you can also lock down unintended changes. So having created a baseline of the desired Reese Plivridge model, the next step is to prevent uncontrolled changes that can fall outside the purview of identity and security team. In practice, this requires locking down the access model so that the users cannot provision additional permissions or privileges or entitlements on their own. These locks should impact the change controls for your joiners, movers, leavers, uh, change management, as well as federated and local accounts to ensure that these are, uh, you know, there are no expect unexpected changes allowed. <clears throat> you can also, uh, once the least privilege has been achieved, it has to be maintained moving forward. So one way to enforce the least privilege is by continually monitoring access uh, usage data and utilizing machine learning analytics. So the process can include things like cleaning uh, users from roles they no longer use or need, removing access privilege from roles uh, that are not in use, preventing privilege escalation paths, i.e. role chaining, monitoring external exposure, and validating the need for external exposure when detected. So the, the principle of least privilege is a, is a fundamental factor in your security and compliance policies. And this can be even taken further towards a zero trust framework. So companies need to be particularly aware of uh, any and every identity trying to access anything across their cloud environments, shifting from the traditional way of thinking about, you know, perimeter security to something much more solid and protective. So the principle of least privilege goes a long way in securing your environments in the ever transforming digital landscape. So we talked a bit about privileged identity management. So similar to conditional access policies, there are now ways we can <clears throat> limit the exposure of privileged identities. So privileged identity management essentially allows us uh, in modern <clears throat> identity and access management systems to limit the potential you know, scope and exposure of privileged identities. So we can create just-in-time access for specific privileged roles. So what I mean by that? Now, if we imagine we provision a user, say IT administrator, there might not be needed administrative permissions on a day-to-day -day basis or during all of their day. So there are now two ways how we can provision roles. We can provision roles as always on, or we can provision roles that users are eligible to acquire. So essentially this creates a process how users are eligible. So for example, you can assign user who is eligible to get global administrator permissions. So this goes through a flow, which is called just-in-time access. So we can create a time-bound um, eligibility for user to acquire that role. So the time bound, what it means. So essentially say administrator needs, needs to elevate their permissions to global administrator to complete a specific task during their day-to-day -day work. So what we can do, we can create a just-in-time access for them to require and, and essentially go through approval flow. <clears throat> so approval flow includes they, uh, they have to select the certain amount of time. So normally it goes, I think, from zero to eight hours where you can acquire global administrator role for your eligibility. Once they select the time, they have to uh, justify and, and write the justification why they need that specific role. And then we can, for example, we can enforce things like multi-factor authentication for role activation. And then also we have to create a flow of who's going to be the approver of the specific roles. So this has to be a second party involved in that transaction that approves that elevation of privileges. And then we also create access review and an audit history. So we review all of these um, uh, privileged identity essentially flows to making sure that people are justifiably elevating their privileges and making sure that only people that need those specific roles have the ability to elevate their roles into our privileged identity management. So it's a great way, again, to limit the potential scope and risk of sensitive and privileged identities in our environment. 
And the last part of our identity and access management um, services are user management. So user management allows our administrators to manage resources and organize users according to their needs and roles while maintaining security of our IT systems. Administrators may need powerful user management capabilities that can allow them to group users and define flexible access policies. So for our end users, many parts of user management are invisible. When users are exposed to user management, for example, when they use a login box to access an application, they expect the interaction to be simple and seamless. So login is a frequently performed critical operation, meaning that, they, that any delay or malfunction annoys users and hurts our productivity. So many organizations recognize that you know, on-premise identity solutions are insufficient for the modern IT environment. So users are increasingly rely on cloud services and access corporate systems remotely, often via personal devices and traditional ID you know, services cannot address these use cases. So organizations must find a way to manage secure access for a distributed environment. At the same time, users demand the same uh, simplicity of popular services, such as like Google and Facebook for their work environment. So these challenges are making user management more important and more complex than ever before. So the main user management functions include a broad range of functions designed to enhance security, improve user experience, and streamline administrative processes. So some of the essential functions are user onboarding and offboarding, so efficient processes for adding new users and deactivating departing ones ensures that only current employees have access to the critical assets. So <clears throat> the modern identity and access management systems now allows to connect various enterprise systems to make provisioning and deprovisioning a lot easier tasks. So most of the identity service providers now can connect to our HR systems. So obviously when a new employee joins our organization, the HR system can define whether it's a permanent employee, whether it's uh, te um, temporary employee, what sort of department they're gonna be working and we can automatically provision role based on what sits in the HR system. So it allows automatic provisioning and deprovisioning, which allows, for example, like if we have a temporary employee that we know is going to join our organization for, say, 60 days worth of work, we can automatically provision a specific role on what they will be working and create a time bound, essentially um, expiry on their role. So after 60 days, their role will be deprovisioned automatically. So this way we reduce the burden, potential risk that, you know, should he leave, he or she leave unhappy, there's a, a very limited amount of risk that can happen because the role will be deprovisioned automatically. You know, role-based access control, so assigns user roles like, you know, administrator, user, guest, and provides access to resources based on these roles. So this minimizes the chance of unauthorized access we also have profile management, so allows users to update their personal details, settings and preferences, enhancing the user experience. So nowadays, you know, IT administrators also have a big burden of tasks to manage all of the users. So the more we can outsource some of these user management activities, so we can create, for example, workflows for self-service password resets, where users can reset their own password instead of going to administrators and creating tickets and creating their, you know, extra burden on them. We can also have things like audit trails and monitoring, so we can keep tracks of user activities, offering insights into who accessed what resources and when. This helps in, you know, detecting and preventing unauthorized activities. We can create automation in our workflows which you know streamlines administrative tasks like, like approval processes for granting specific permissions which we, we you know we kind of discussed a bit about it you know we can also integrate with other systems so more the more modern user um, access management tools can be integrated with other software you know such as uh, crm systems you know i just mentioned about hr systems you know cloud services uh, you know, which allows essentially consistent data and reduced administrative overhead. You know, we touched on single sign-on where we can 
connect our you know specific organization applications under one identity service provider which can allow a single sign-on capabilities we can create a password policies to en enforce strong password requirements and periodic changes to enhance our security so all of this user management essentially is the way to reduce the burden but as well as to minimize the risk you know profile management deprovisioning provisioning and single sign-on these are the key benefits of user management how we reduce the risk as well as reduce the burden on our IT services and how we can leverage the identity and access management services to our benefit so Thank you guys for listening in. Hopefully you learned something new and hopefully, you know, we covered quite in depth one of the key pillars of cloud security, which is identity and access management services. Please like and subscribe if you would like to go through all of the video series where we're going to cover the other main pillars of cloud security. Thank you guys.